Awesome. Well, welcome everybody. This is the sixth Irrational Labs membership event, but a little bit of hype, please. Next week, we have an open event for everybody. It's an Irrational Labs thing. Um, Seth Stevens Davidowitz is going to be speaking about his new book, Don't Trust Your Gut. The subtitle is what gets you using data to get what you really want in life. So if you really want things in life, you want to come to this next week. I will send you the um, sign up link in the chat uh, once we get rolling. Uh, we Because it's not a membership event, it's an open event. We have a spe separate sign up process. But please, please, please come to that. And it's going to be hosted by your guide today, um, our managing director, Evelyn Gosnell. So it is a super treat, interactive Q&A. Her slides are hot. You're going to enjoy it. That said, um, so what's going on today is how I became a behavioral scientist with Evelyn. Um, Thursday is this open event, next Thursday. Friday, Colin comes back, our friend, to talk more about saving and spending with household budgets. Um, and then in June, we have two things slated. So using BSI frameworks with Pauline Captis and um, asking better questions with behavioral science. So both- And I don't, I don't mean to interrupt you, but your, your screen, at least for me, still says Irrational Labs has started screen sharing, but we don't see it. Oh, well, that is a good detail. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. While Ryan's figuring that out, everyone raise your hand if you guys are sick of like in these COVID times, it's like, you're muted, right? Like, or like hey, you're on mute, unmute yourself. I think that's, that's like 2020 and 2021, like phrase of the year, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, at least they could hear me for better or for worse. Can you people see it now or no? Nope. Just Irrational Labs has started screen sharing. Well, you know what? For the sake of things being more normal, I will just say, Evelyn, you take over the deck because I just had one slide left. And uh, so it's we can pretend it's radio and now we're going to video. That's a very high tech. Um, so Evelyn is going to talk to you about her journey. Normally we give big, big, big intros, but Evelyn's basically going to tell you her biography today. Um, it's an exciting one. She is a worldwide person, and um, she will enlighten you with, with her journey to leading our organization. So, Evelyn, can you screen share? Um, yeah, but I don't need to. I don't have slides. This is going to be an informal conversation. Oh, I thought you had slides. Oh, no. my gosh. So exciting. No, no slides. Oh, my gosh. Just you. That's so great. Well, I will, I will leave you to it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the just though, just me. Oh, no, 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 you're awesome. You're wonderful. You dress nicely today. Um, take it away. Take it away. <laughs> uh, no slides for the win. Okay. Awesome. Thanks. Um, so let's keep this super particip participatory. I don't know about you all, but I miss the times, the good old days when we actually got to do stuff in person. So we're going to try and make this as much as though we're in person as possible. If you feel comfortable, turn on your camera. That's nice. It just makes me feel like I'm talking to a folk, you know, group of uh, people in the room, but I totally get the Zoom fatigue. That's also real. So that's totally fine. So um, I'm going to talk through uh, one, one thing that I want to open with, actually, just out of curiosity, because I'm very flexible with this, is are you all here because you would like to be a behavioral scientist? Or are you in the realm of like, I'm going to be a, I'm a, I am a product manager, I want to stay a product manager, but behavioral science helps me do my thing better and pro fill in the blank for product manager it could be any other thing, maybe put in chat. Um, or if you really want to, if we want to, I think a small enough group, we could unmute a little bit and share. Um, but but chat's also fine. Maybe one brave person. We we picked on Richard earlier, so who should we pick on now? Sarah, Sarah, why are you here? I was just typing in the chat that uh, I work in human services, but I feel like I missed my calling a little bit with the behavioral science that I've been learning about. And um, I'm not willing to leave human services, but want to learn as much as I can to apply it to our work. Okay, wonderful. So we, it sounds like we have a mix. Some people do want to be a be, be behavioral scientist and some people want to stay in their thing, but use behavioral science uh, methods um, and techniques to improve their craft. Um, and by the way, so let, let's, again, keep this. Oh, do, do we have a hand raised? Safi, are you raising your hand or are you high-fiving? Which is it? I forgot to put it down. My bad. Sorry? I forgot to put it down. Okay, no worries. Yeah, sorry. Okay, so let's, um, I have the short version of this and the long version of this. I guess since we are all here today, uh, we'll go with the longer version for shits and giggles. 
Um, so Brian kind of started with the fact that I have an international background, and I think that is very much uh, related to why I ended up here. So my parents uh, were diplomats, and we moved around a lot, and I was in many different countries, and the cultural context was constantly changing, and the rules of the game, what's normal in society, uh, was very different, and this included being in the Soviet Union. Um, you know, that's these are there's stories there for another day. The first McDonald's that opened in, in Moscow. The line was four hours long in the very beginning. All of, all of those things. Um, very random fun fact, and we will, we will then get to the point. But random fun fact, my two younger sisters were in the same ballet class as Putin's two daughters. They're the same age, and they were in the same, same ballet class back in the day. So what this kind of created in me, though, was this curiosity of, I think, big picture was this nature versus nurture question. And, and um, I think just the roots of wanting to be a social scientist were probably planted there. Uh, I studied cultural anthropology in undergrad at Duke. And afterwards graduated and was like, this is wonderful. This was fascinating. And what the heck do I do next? What does one do? Um, so it wasn't obvious. So from a practical standpoint of like paying the bills, got into product management. Um, that seemed like the closest relevant application of like, yes, there's actually a field here. Um, people will pay, pay me money to have a job. So I became a product manager. And I did that for a number of years in various roles. Um, part of this, again, I won't go on random asides, but part of this was in France. Christian Dior, I think kind of, if you've seen, raise their hand if you've seen the movie uh, Devil Wears Prada. Yeah, it was a little bit of that kind of vibe in, in the environment. Um, but ultimately, and what's probably most interesting to you all is discovered, like kind of stumbled upon behavioral economics a, a little bit randomly, arbitrarily, like read Dan, Ariel, Dan Ariely's Predictably Irrational. I don't know if you all had this experience, but kind of was like, holy shit, this is so cool. People are paid money to do this. Like I've done, <laughs> Sarah, maybe like, oh, I've, I've, I've got, you know, in the wrong field. I've missed my calling. How do I do this? Um, so really, I think the second piece there was when you're a product manager, you're thinking so often about how to change people, you know, change people's behavior, how to get them to do, do X. Um, and this seemed like a much more rigorous, methodical, um, science-based way. And too much of my work and the people around me was like, well, my gut tells me this, my intuition tells me this. And so often as we, as all of you know, going through this program, um, we can be very much wrong in that. So that was kind of the root of the origin story of like, oh, I really want to do this. I ended up meeting Dan um, and said, I really want to do this. What do I need to do? you tell me, I'll do whatever you say. You tell me, do I need to get a PhD? I'll go get a PhD. And he uh, you know, gave some very valuable uh, inputs to me. The first question really said was, why do you want to do this? Do you want to teach? If you want to teach, then obviously, absolutely, you need to go and get a PhD. Um, but if you don't, you do not necessarily need to. In fact, I may advise against it. There are so many companies doing this work there um, and that you may be able to actually learn faster by doing. So I said, okay, Dan says, I don't need to do a PhD. I'm not, I'm not going to do the PhD. Um, so one of the things that he did is connected me with people doing some of the work. So uh, in this case, I worked with some professors out of UCSD and I, <laughs> This was early in the earlier days of the field where I, I just wanted to get my foot in the door and was like, tell me what to do. I'll do whatever it takes. And um, as an aside, one of the tests that this professor gave me to see if like, obviously she, she took Dan's uh, recommendation uh, to heart, but also wanted to test me for herself. So she gave me a paper that she had written that had been rejected for publication she sent it to me and she's like, cool, read this paper. Tell me why it sucks. That was her test for me. And I was like, oh, this is a pretty hard test because I'm like, how do I tell her her idea? Like, it, it was very uncomfortable for me, right? It was like, well, how do you identify what sucks about her paper? Also, I want to work with you and help you. So I had to frame it as like these, if we were to rerun these studies, this is what I might do differently. Um, and it ended up like, like I said, kind of working with her um, for a while 
And then somewhere along the line, oh, I think a relevant point here too is at that time, again, the, the landscape is different now, but at that time, there weren't as many companies doing this work. So there was a little bit of a need when you want to be self-taught, you know, the Irrational Labs boot camp didn't exist, right? There weren't, there was at the time more of like PhD or, you know, how do I figure this out by myself? And, and so for me, it was very much of a learn by doing. I want to roll up my sleeves. I want to be scrappy. So I, you know, it was cheesy. I made a blog. I started writing. I started running my own experiments. So one of the things that you all have learned very well in behavioral economics is we can't predict, we don't necessarily clearly understand our preferences or predict how we might behave. Can, can we all agree that that's one of the big insights from behavioral science? Yeah. Okay. So I chose, this is just one example, I, but I did a lot of this. I chose a story. I was like, how can I, I need to build up my chops of experimentation and this idea of the difference between people's preferences and how they actually behave. So life gave me an, a, a good one or, or a fun one. I noticed that friends around me, male friends in particular would say, I don't, you know, why, why do women wear so much makeup? I don't understand why they do this. They look better without it. Um, you know, I, I just kept hearing, anyone hear this? Raise your hand. Yeah. Becca, you can relate. There's this kind of, oh, there's, you know, too many women wearing too much makeup. And I'm like, that's very interesting because that is not my experience. In my experience, I am treated differently when I wear makeup versus when I don't. And this is a perfect example of how you can experiment because what's the confound? Anyone think, can you think of what's the confound of why I'm treated differently um, with makeup or without? It's the interactive part, you can unmute. Self-esteem, confidence, exactly. Okay, that's great. So that's how I might think. That's one, great, great job, Edgar. What's the second one? The location. So I'm more likely to be wearing makeup if I am at a bar, right? I am less likely to be wearing makeup if I'm going grocery store shopping. So people coming up and flirting with me could just be a function of you're at a bar versus the grocery store. That would be what a, a nice example of what we call the confound. So how do we measure this? So I did two things. First, I did a survey just to confirm that it wasn't just like me and my friend group, just the, you know, so I did a survey with men saying, what is your preference, makeup, no makeup, and had them do this. And again, this is just me by myself. I'm nobody. I'm just like, I'm just gonna go and run this survey. Um, and then, I go on, it was, I think it was OkCupid okay back in the day, and I create two profiles. And I try to write the description as blandly as possible because I don't want anything to be memorable to stand out in the profile. So the profile, as we know well know from experimental design, needs to be the same. The profile needs to be exactly the same. The timing needs to be the same. So that there's no, we know that there's different effects, right? Around Valentine's Day, right before Valentine's Day, there's a big sign up. <laughs> there's more people on the apps doing the things because they want to find someone before Valentine's Day. It's also probably a New Year's resolution uh, effect there going on. So anyway, they needed to launch at the same time. So I needed to have two profiles. And actually I do, speaking of slides, I actually can share the actual slides of this, um, the screen. I knew it was just a matter of time. <laughs> well, these are slides from for, for next week, but you guys are getting a sneak preview of this. So I launched these two profiles with and without makeup um, with the same description in the profile. And anyone want to take a guess? What's the, okay, so first of all, what's the dependent variable here? We're learning about my background, but also doing a, like a pop quiz on behavioral science. What's the dependent variable? What are you going to measure? Likes, responses, yep, yep, great. So at the time, I don't think it was like this. Again, I'm I'm aging, I'm dating myself here. But at the time, it was messages. Um, so I measured the number of messages that I got, and I got thirty percent more messages for the makeup profile. Uh, you could actually, arguably, have a different dependent variable, or you could also try to qualitatively measure. This would mean you would want someone blind 
someone separate. So I could have said, hey, Ryan, I'm going to give you a bunch of messages. You tell me how good are they in terms of how much is this person signaling that they want a relationship versus a hookup, any of those things. And so you could have someone separately kind of rate. That is a more complex um, experiment. The, the most important kind of easy dependent variable here is just messages. Everyone following? How did I in isolate the impact of naming? So my name, you meaning my, what my name was? Yeah, you probably created two different profiles with different names, right? And so if one was Margaret yeah. versus one was Wendy, maybe people were more attracted to Wendy than Margaret. That's great. That's very insightful. I actually don't know if I created names. Um, I think also, that's a great point. I should actually look that up. Um, I think it was at the time you might have even had just like profile names. You know how like AOL, you just had like, like it was like a off on or something like that. Yeah, it was something. I don't know that I had names, but that would be a great thing. And a uh, small pitch for next week's uh, event. It's something that Seth Stephen Davidovitz has looked at actually preferences for names. We're super irrational on this. Even if you take away all photo stuff, we have strong preferences for, and he's to kind of defined names that are sexy and names that are unsexy. Um, I, I read that and I, and my sister's name, unfortunately is in the unsexy list. And I was like, Oop, not going to tell her this. Don't come to my webinar. <laughs> um, okay. So anyway, that was just to illustrate. Um, at the time, it required a certain amount of scrappiness. It, it, like I said, there was no boot camp. There was, and it, it was very much in my mind. I got to learn by doing, right? I, I need to be scrappy. I needed to have a blog. A, if I was going to go to anyone and say, "Look, I am interested in doing this work," I needed to have my thoughts, my way of thinking, all kind of outlined. One more quick example of that, just for fun. Um, has anyone heard of Hal, Hirsch, Hal Hirschfeld's research out of UCLA on how we think about ourselves versus our future selves? Anyone familiar with this? No. OK, great. Well, this makes it even more fun to tell. OK, so what he has looked at is how we might think about Imagine you are thinking about your next birthday. Everyone do that for a second. Your upcoming next soonest birthday, imagine it. What do you see? Someone unmute and, and tell me, tell me the scene that you see. Way too many candles. <laughs> Who else? Joelle, you want to tell us what you, you might see? I feel like this year, my birthday is very much going to be very low key. I just had a baby. So I feel like the attention is no longer on me, <laughs> even at my birthday. Congrats. Well, I hope you do Thank get you. a little moment for yourself. <laughs> um, okay. So, to oh, okay, great. Thanks. Uh, that's not family, friends, cake. Absolutely. So this is a common thing. We tend to think when we think of our immediate, our next upcoming birthday, we see the scene around us. We see it from our first person. We see it here. Now think about your birthday. Imagine you're turning 80, 75, 80. Let's pick a round number up there. Now think about that for a moment. How do you see the scene? One of the things that changes for a lot of people is the perspective that they're seeing it from. So when you're seeing your upcoming next birthday, you're seeing it from this perspective and I'm seeing the friends and family around me. When I think of my 80th birthday, I'm actually seeing it from the side. I see myself in the picture and I see I'm no longer Evelyn. I, I can, there's almost two of me. I, I'm seeing from the side. Anyone relate to that? Would you have that experience when you're thinking about it? This is a common way of thinking about it. And what that indicates, what, he, what Hal Hirschfeld actually showed is that the parts of our brain that are activated when we think about ourself in the short term is different than we think about our future self. And what, the way we think about our future self is the same as how we think about others. So it's almost like our future 80 year old self is not me. And how is that relevant? Why should we care? One big example, 
financials, right? Retirement savings. If we are not mo as motivated, if we think about our future 80 year old Evelyn self is a different person, it's not as easy for me to care about Evelyn <laughs> at 80 years old. It's not as easy for me to put away money that I could be spending right now on myself on fun things and give it to future Evelyn to make sure that she has a roof over her head and has money to, to do the things that, that she wants to do, right? Even now I'm saying she, right? So that's indicative. So what his research has done, what he's looked at is, can we, um, he did a thing with, um, I think VR, virtual reality, where you look in the mirror and you see your future, you like aged. If you looked in your mirror, and they like did this aging thing on you. And then they said, okay, now you're gonna uh, select how much you wanna save for retirement. That intervention, the timing of that intervention and bringing it right before the ask of how much you wanna save for retirement increased people's uh, choices of how much they're going to save. So very powerful. So for me, back to the whole scrappy thing, I was like, this shit is fascinating. What am I going to do with this? How, how do I push this forward? How do I, I'm not, I don't, especially this was again, quite a number of years ago, I didn't have access to any kind of VR and how am I going to age myself? And I think now there's probably technology, like tools that do that, right? Filters. There was none of that. So I go on Craigslist. I write up, I'm like, I need a makeup artist. This sounds really weird, but come to my house and can you age me by 30 years? So I find a random makeup artist on Craigslist. She comes over, she does the whole thing. She, I felt very uncomfortable if I'm being honest. Like there was a part of me cause we were taking pictures. I'm gonna put it on the blog. And I was like, there was a moment I'm telling you guys among friends where I was like, oh, you aged me too much. Can we undo some of it? I don't want a picture like this. Like the vein side of me was like, no, I look like I don't like this, but I sat with it, right? And that was the point of the exercise is to see myself as old, old, my, the older self connect that. And that is me. And so that's where I got to kind of write a blog story about this. Again, this is all just two quick examples of the narrative of being scrappy, being creative, figuring it out, do what you need to do. I think now what that looks like is probably different. There's a lot more, you know, can you approach a company and being and come to them with a problem that they're trying to solve and be like, hey, I am trained in behavioral science. I can help you do X, Y, Z thing. I think there's there's just a lot. It's a different landscape that, that now. So what I might advise now um, is different than, than from, from my past. Um, but what I will say is, I think why I get to do the cool work that I do, right? And I'm happy to talk about that too. Really awesome projects. We did work with TikTok on reducing uh, misinformation, the spread of misinformation on the platform. We've done work with Indeed. We've done work with LinkedIn. We've done work with Microsoft. All of these um, cool, exciting projects. I think the reason that we can do them well is having this background in product management. So, so often I'm speaking to product people. I understand their language. I understand their pain points. I understand what they care about, what they're being measured on. I understand their roadblocks, their constraints. So then it's a question of saying, how do we fit behavioral science within that versus just coming purely from the outside? Um, and there's, you know, it's wonderful. There's so many academics now. There's many, many more programs of behavioral science Many people who have deep expertise in the field, and yet sometimes there's a gap of saying, like, you might have the latest and greatest and know very deeply who's done what research on this very, very nuanced question, and yet, do you know how to work with the company and say, cool, you've got a problem that you need to solve, and I'm going to help you think about how to solve it. I'm going to fit it in your process. I'm going to understand your language, your constraints. I think this is really the sweet sauce, um, the, in a, the, the sweet spot. Um, and happy to talk with you all if you have questions. If because I'm I'm sharing very concretely from a product manager standpoint and how much we fit with that. But I know that not everyone in the room is a product manager, so I'm also happy to to take questions um, there. Evelyn, I have a question. So you know, oftentimes this is great. Your product background helps. You know, a lot of times institutions try to put a narrow eye on things. And so how do you do that on the outset when you don't really know, right? You're trying to be provocative. You're trying to, uh, you know, take them, you know, let them consider 
your idea, but then they're not going to move if, if, you know, if it's not going to yield the results that they want. And so how do you put some numeric around that so that they say, yeah, let's do this? Yeah, that's a great question and a tricky one, right? Because you really don't necessarily know how well something is going to work. That's where having multiple things in play is a good thing. So let's just make that concrete. I know that's a little bit vague. So imagine uh, TikTok, right? TikTok came to us and they said, look, we've got this, like every platform, social media platform, we've got this challenge of, of misinformation, uh, we would love your help in helping us thinking about that, think about this and reduce this. We did a literature review, a deep understanding of the latest and greatest research on what may work. Um, and then we we did pre-testing on MTurk, uh, which is to basically say, let's identify before we kind of not waste, but before we use up scarce resources on, on running an experiment, let's pre-test in advance so that we give you the winning horses in the first place. We identify which ones may win. And then for the experiment itself, let's run more than one condition. You can have a much greater confidence level that one of them may work if you're going in with several rather than like, I have the solution. I knew the thing. It's going to work. Cool. Done. Right. That you're going to have a lot harder guess. Um, of how much <laughs> effectiveness it may have versus if you're if you're running several. Now, one thing I will say that's tricky with companies is their understanding of a large effect size is uh, often different <laughs> than from the behavioral sciences. So, if you in, within behavioral science, if you look at common papers, it, often it's like a great, it's wonderful to have a five percent reduction in something or increase. Right? These are these are actually if. It, at, if you're running it with a large enough um, group, and this is just statistically significant finding, 5% is great. From the company's standpoint, you kind of need to put that in context sometimes. A 24% reduction in shares of potential misinformation, which is what we got, is huge. But I think you part of it, it's our job to like kind of tell that story and relativize that to help them fully appreciate how huge that really is. Does that answer your question, Edgar? Oh, yeah, thank you. Great. Next question. Ryan, also, if you want to, I know you're like our, Ryan is our facilitator or extraordinaire. I know, but you're, but you're the main event. I'm just letting you hold court, Evelyn, but I'll, I'll but I'll facilitate. I mean, if you need me to jump in, I'm there. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's take more questions. Because I'm happy to jump around. I know I give a brief overview, but let's take maybe more questions. And also, should we? I'm just fiddling. Oh, Gabriella has a question, but, but fiddle away. But but here we, we go. Um, just a question. So, if I do not have a PhD, so I'm an economist, I'm psychologist. So mm -hmm. it's a good combination. But I'm in Germany, <laughs> and when I say I'm a behavioral scientist, uh, it's a funny, ah, oh, you're the doctor, you have a PhD. No, uh, I'm not, as I don't use uh, this title. So I, 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 I thought myself, uh, I am a psychologist and economist with a behavioral economics, behavioral science background. It's a little bit, so because uh, it's, it's, it's funny to work so what, what should I say? I, I, it's, it's maybe it's a German problem, <laughs> but yeah, what, what should you, yeah. what would you? Um, it is, say? it is a common problem. And the number of times, by the way, that people have misattributed a PhD to me, um, I've gotten PhD. I've also gotten introduced uh, there. I was on a podcast once and yeah, they introduced me as, um, you know, being from, having graduated from Harvard. I was like, uh, not really. Um, so I think there's a couple things going on here. One is there is confusion when you say behavioral scientists that people start to think, oh, you're like a medical doctor, you're a psychologist, you deal with children's behavioral problems. And, and so I think that um, is a small uh, number of, of, of times, but it certainly happens. And my guess is that it probably happens a little bit more uh, in Europe. So I think this is, I mean, the, the real thing that I would say here, and this is such a cheesy like cop out as a behavioral scientist, I think you should try different things. Um, and experiment and see what lands best. Um, that would be my my advice because I think in the culture I, I'm not familiar. My parents do live in in Germany. Uh, after all those travels, they were like, "Where should we land in the world?" And they they live in Berlin. So kudos to your your country. Um, but I think it it does vary. And so I think you 
I would play around with different variants of what you just said. Sarah. Thanks. Well, thanks for being here and chatting with us today. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, I work in human services and we are doing a lot of mean continuous improvement in human services, which is really related to behavioral science, I think as well, for you know continuous improvement and finding problems and testing things, testing solutions. So not everybody in our uh, department can take this course, this boot camp that we have, or can you know get trained in lean um, continuous improvement. So, what's your advice to kind of bring people along? And um, you know, there might be um, resistance to some of our ideas, just be, maybe because we've learned more. What, what what's some of your advice about we kind of bringing people along? Yeah. I mean, now you're trained, right? So you, we've invested, or we, you've invested in yourself. Your company has invested in you. Um, you have a lot of these insights. I think now it's almost like an opportunity and, you know, depending on how uh, aggressively you want to frame this responsibility of yours to, to teach others. And so let me give you a couple of tips on, on training um, that I use fairly commonly and just over the years kind of have learned. I think one of the tricky parts of behavioral science is when you share, after you've shared the answer to any given experiment, it seems like the light bulb goes off and it's like, oh yeah, of course, it's obvious, duh. That, that there's kind of this effect of once you've explained it, it seems obvious, you've kind of lost the power of it or like they, they, they now, <laughs> the human brain is fascinating, right? And then it now changes, it's like, oh yeah, I knew that all along. So one thing you want to do here is actually get them to feel that, make them aware actually that their intuition was wrong. So imagine you're telling the story. So, so, so first of all, tell the story of experiments. The boot camp is full of them, right? Experiment, expect or experiment, expect, experiment. You're thinking about, um, uh, let's think, let, let, let's think about the power of non-financial incentives. You might think about the coin study, right? You might, which is in Kenya and everyone raise your hand. I wanna make sure I'm reading the room, right? You guys familiar with this one? Okay, so perfect. So Sarah, how would you, let's put you on the spot here if you're willing. How would you tell the story of that? Do you remember? Um, so this is the one um, where there are different co coins. Um, that something has like a child's face or um it's about saving right it's, it's about saving for the future and they can get a i'm scrambling good, here I, I i'm i definitely put you on the hot seat so the the context here is this is in cabera in nairobi and you're, we're trying to help people who are at the very very kind of bottom of the poverty scale the open question is can we help, help them at all is saving even a realistic goal? Is it possible? Just We're not talking about retirement at all, right? We're just talking about emergency bare minimum kind of money to the side. Can we do that? Because what happens, this is based in like, if what happens if they do, um, let's say they have, you know, they're at subsistence level, they have a goat that, um, you know, they sell the goat's milk. Um, but if the goat dies, like it's kind of the end of, end of the world and the interest rates. And, and so they go and down this hole. So how the open question for this research was, can we is saving possible? And then you describe the four conditions. There were four conditions here. One of them was people were incentivized to, they were matched. If they were they saved a certain amount, they got matched at the end of the week. And the second condition, they were pre-matched, right? So this is loss aversion. So you kind of explain loss aversion briefly. Um, in the third condition, they got a text message and it was framed as though it was from their kid. So their kid's name is John, Johnny, and it's like, Johnny wants you to save money for the future. Um, and then the fourth condition was this coin. Uh, and I've already given away, right? <laughs> because I called it the coin study. But the coin, you, you tell the story of there was this coin. It was, it was plastic, but it looked gold. And you scratched on the weeks that you saved and you didn't scratch, uh, you, know, you marked basically whether you saved or not. So the key here in, in this example, and in an example, you pause, don't call it the coin, like I read it, right? This is not, I didn't do it well. But in this case, you would just tell the story without calling it the coin study. And you would pause and say, which one do you think won? 
And if you're in a room full of people, you can say, okay, you're, this is forced choice. You're going to have to pick one, raise your hand. And so you want everyone to see where the hands go up. So what typically happens is most of the votes ha vote happen on financial. And then you can then kind of tell the story of what happened, what actually happened. But there's a very, very different thing when you physically have gotten people to you can't now undo the fact that your hand went up in the same way that if you just thought about it, you can mentally do some gymnastics being like, oh, I knew that all along. So that's the power of, that's my pro tips on how to train people with behavioral science. Tell it through stories, right? Use studies, memorize some of the key studies. You don't need to know the exact difference of it increased by 12%, you know, people don't care about that. You can do that. If you memorize the numbers, you probably will look, your confidence, <laughs> your perceived confidence may look a little bit higher. Um, but I think more importantly, the breadth of knowledge. So you should have a study that you know for mental accounting. You should have a study that you know for defaults. You should have a study that you know for social norms. Some of the biggest principles, memorize those studies, practice telling them, and tell them in a way that's compelling. Pause, make people, give them that moment of thinking, get making them guess, and then just reveal, reveal the results. Okay, who is next? Ryan, who's next? Uh, Matt is on deck. He had a, a chat question that I'd like you to surface. If you're there, Matt, where are you at? Where are you located geographically? We know you're in Zoom land, but... Yeah, if you can hear me, I'm from Arlington, Virginia. Excellent, Sweet. excellent. Well, bring on your um, clarifying question. It was a great one. Okay, well, thanks for the advice on the stories and the polling. I think that's awesome. I think I could probably execute that through Zoom with a poll, maybe even yeah. Uh, yeah. pull that off. Um, but I struggle. Um, I'm trying to build a team and trying to sort of bring in this capability to like we're a division within a large company. And it's really challenging. Like they want to, as John List talks about one of his books, they want to tinker a lot, but not necessarily test. They like to try something new. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm, I'm temptation bundling. I've been working out at the same time as, <laughs> as doing this. But um, I um so they want to do things like, well, let's try this on 20 people, look at directional results and scale. That's kind of the attitude because and if you try to introduce any more rigor than that, like having a control group or a powered sample size, um, it starts to look academic. So it's really hard to, to, to move the culture along. Um, so I'm trying to look for, I mean, I, I keep hearing over and over, and I think you kind of said it, for early tests and interventions, try to find some big wins that show a large impact that, you know, shows up on the radar. And, uh, you know, that's a struggle. And then, but ultimately, right, not everything's gonna be a big win, low hanging fruit. And you and so I, I've heard of this term of value engineering and high velocity incrementalism, where you're like, you know, there's a lot of small marginal improvements that you can you can get to that add up to like a big change in business. And, and you know, as far as being more competitive and being more innovative, but it's, sometimes it's a lot of small improvements do you agree with that or is that an, is that something to transition to and how do you sell the small improvements when especially uh everybody's looking for big big wins yeah that's a great question matt and thanks for, for asking kind of the tough question by the way shout out um i am lived in falls church virginia as well <laughs> went to george mason high school which is uh yeah it should be near you yeah um, near you. <laughs> so um Couple things. Let's let's touch on. So first of all, my one of my questions to be is to you is what is the sample size that you have access to? So one of the things we deal with a lot is like startups who come to us and are like, "Cool, we want to do testing." It's like you only have three hundred users or a thousand users or you know early early stages. So do you actually have? What's the user base? I don't know for, enough. About. Yeah, for now, for for some metrics and outcomes that we we can have into the hundreds or thousands for sure, especially some of our email outreach campaigns. Um, and, okay. you know, but there's still that reluctance like to, to experiment. Yeah. Okay, so you said email. Email to me is like no brainer, easiest, one of the lowest lift. There's so many platforms that allow us easy, simple, like you absolutely should be testing email. Like everyone should be, email is some of the, is I would say not the most exciting, not the highest impact. But in terms of building some wins and actually like using a platform to show the value of testing, email is such a duh, it's so easy. 
Um, you're not changing like on an app, right? Like the, the opposite of this would be like on an app, build two different features and randomly assign users to like that's, you have to engineer both features. You have to you know, like, that's much more complex. Email is no brainer. The other thing that I would say, and I don't know if this applies to you directly, but since we're sharing with everyone in the room, MTurk, right? So MTurk, going back to the TikTok example, but this is very common for us in any other, you can do easy, cheap testing off platform. Um, and you can try and select, in the case of TikTok, we were able to filter for TikTok users. So we did not do this outright. The way that we did this was early on in the question said, you know, you, you kind of, they answered a few questions to kind of start off. And we said, which of these social media platforms do you use? And they marked off which ones they used. If they didn't happen to check TikTok, we eliminated them from the survey process. So you don't want to actually give it away because you want people to be honest. You don't want to be like, we're looking for TikTok users. And then people are like, yeah, I'm a TikTok user because I want to get paid for this survey. Um, so that's another, I think, thing in the toolkit in terms of if you're blocked from doing tests within the platform or within your product, you can do a lot outside and come with some significant results and say, look, I've pre-tested this. It's not guaranteed that these real results will hold in the product, but it's certainly de-risked um, in advance. Um, I think your, who's the MTurk audience? Um, who signs up for it? This is a great question. So um, there is a little bit of a, a bias. It's not perfectly representative, but you can filter and you can try and match your population as much as you can. So like demo, you can ask all kinds of demographic questions um, so that you can clo more closely match uh, your demographics. That is great. That sounds like really getting scrappy because I do have a lot of lot of constraints around what I can do. So that's very helpful. I'll, I'll def I've heard of MTurk, but I thought it was more like I took a uh, like more like how many times can you press the H key on a keyboard kind of like psychological tests or something I've heard about. I didn't realize it could be so practical. So thank oh, yeah. Super practical. Maybe Ryan, this is a side note, like maybe we do a, um, an event. We have one of our behavioral scientists come and do a mini train. I mean, enter. you can't I learn it in an hour, but we could do a mini, mini, mini training. You got I one? I know someone with the initials KP who might be perfect for that, but I'm just saying. <laughs> Great. Um, okay. Who wants to be our next? Any other questions? You guys look, some of you look so thoughtful. Richard, you look very thoughtful right now. <laughs> yeah, I was just, I was writing that note down. So I'm monitoring. Anybody else have any profound things to ask or just silly things? We take either because we are equal opportunity discussers. Hey, I'm you, so I was sorry. This is uh, just putting my face here because I, I know how it feels to speak with a name or towards a name. But, so no, it was interesting. You, Edgar. Yeah, like Chris, man. Um, so it was interesting talking about this, the power of stories. And so you're a great storyteller. I know um, that is as well. All, all the great, you know, the good behavioral scientists are just awesome at storytelling. And it actually, it was interesting. Yesterday I gave a presentation on uh, some micro experiments that I'm running. And it was exactly this, even though they're very small, like, you know, hundred people, less than hundred people. What I realized was with every single experiment, I had an, a very large win, even though it was small. So like from three people that accepted to like nine people, to like 36. And so that's exactly what I did. I, I showed the first two and then the very end, I said, well, how, you know, based on what you've seen, what do you think is the next number? And they said like 25, 26, 30. I was like, boom, you're all wrong. It's beyond that, it's 36. So that actually got some chuckles and some laughs and some support saying, wow, this is going the right direction. Even though the money invested was so small and so tiny that, you know, if it would have been, now, now think about it, imagine if it would have been like millions of dollars, right? how much more of an impact. And so I think don't underestimate, I think there's a, uh, a proverb it says, you know, do not despise small beginnings, right? And I think that's something that I just wanna leave the group with. You know, it doesn't matter how small it is, as long as the trajectory is going in the right direction, then you should have some uh, headwinds or backwinds. Yeah, yeah, thanks for sharing. And thanks for turning on camera too. It, it does it does uh, feel better to talk to <laughs> real humans. And so at some point we're just gonna be in these like VR things and it's gonna actually feel like we're together. I, I don't think that's that that far away, um, but maybe I'm biased because I live in, in the Bay Area. Um, one more thing that I wanna share if we're, while we're waiting for maybe a, a couple last questions is, and again, this is very much informed from my bias of like, you know, Silicon Valley, working a lot with tech and products. But one of the things I would say, and maybe I can broaden it to, to everyone in the room is 
try and think about you, your brain should be constantly activating on your opportunity space. So what I mean by that is I work very often with tech. I use most of us in the room, right? Use various these various platforms. Who's Uber, who uses Uber? Who uses Lyft? Who uses DoorDash? Who uses, you know, all of the, what, what, what's your banking app? What are the tools that you use? Um, Google Maps, even things like that. There's lots of ways you can think about your, your mindset should not just be, oh, I'm a user, right? I'm, I need to call a ride for Lyft. It's I'm a behavioral scientist. And I'm, as I'm looking at the experience, I'm thinking about, wow, they're using this principle on me. How effective do I think it is? Or what might I do differently? So an example of this, and I don't remember if it's Uber or Lyft, maybe it's both, but an example of this was very recently for me was you're trying to call a car. It gives you these price options. And it's like, if you subscribe, let's say the ride is like, whatever, $20. But it's like, if you subscribe for this monthly fee where you pay $10 a month, your ride would be $12 or $10. And so I have these two options and I'm like, ah, what's happening to me? I'm stressed. I don't know. Right now though, what do I care about? I need to get to my doctor's appointment. I don't care. I don't have the time and energy to deal with this cognitive load. I need to get to the doctor's appointment. I'm going to say no, because I don't know. I haven't had time to think about the math. So I say no. And then what happens later? I'm sitting in the ride. I'm on my way. I've got a 10 minute ride. Now is the time to ask me because I'm doing nothing anyway. And you should be, and I'm, and I'm got this kind of dead space where I could calculate and you should actually retroactively, it, if I were Uber or Lyft, I would actually retroactively show um, it would apply to this ride, even though you said no, or like, actually, I would probably even just time the ask. I wouldn't even ask at the beginning. So this is a question of timing, right? Basic behavioral science thing of the, when we do the ask matters. And so this would be, what I'm trying to share here is for your space, constantly be thinking and Maybe you do a blog, maybe you don't, but it's like, you should be, I do screenshots. If you follow me on Twitter, if you're interested in this, by the way, I tweet a lot about this. I have a recent one that was all around DoorDash and the tipping that DoorDash was, the interventions that DoorDash was trying to do to increase tips. And so you wanna just put yourself in the shoes of, if I'm a product manager at DoorDash and how do I, my job is to increase people's tips so that DoorDashers get more money because right now gas prices have gone up. How am I gonna do that? What interventions, what, what's in my intervention toolkit? Which if I were to run experiment, what would be my three or four conditions that I would run against each other? Things like that. So be thinking about that in your space. That would be one of my, my big tips for you all as well. Okay, do we have questions? Oh, yeah, yeah, I was just gonna say, I shared the tweet, uh, I just shared a tweet of hers, but please do follow her on the Twitters. Um, Evelyn, could I, I always enjoy your BE in the wilds. Could you just share another one? Is there another one that comes to mind that you were like, that you shared on the webs and you were like, dang, that was crazy. Um, I, you really put me on the spot all of a sudden. Well, um, I try, I try. I should go to one your of the things. One <laughs> of the things that I thought about, maybe this is like recency bias and I have DoorDash in my head. I thought about carefully and I, 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 I don't have the exact answer. I haven't thought about enough, but I noticed, had, did any of you guys raise your hands? Did you order during kind of the early moments of COVID when we didn't fully, like you kind of wanted to support restaurants, but we weren't entirely sure what was, like early in those phases, um, what the apps did was they changed the norm. They said, um, drop, they like, it used to be that you would get your order from your dasher there was kind of a human interaction that happened. And they changed that and they said, the, your dasher, please don't come out. Your dasher is gonna leave your food in front of your door. And then you know, you'll, you'll, you'll pick it up after they've gone. We'll notify you when they're gone. There was some change, I don't remember the exact wording, but for me, this actually triggered the similar thoughts around tipping. Cause I said, what this does is it slightly dehumanizes the experience. I no longer see the person in the face. So I'm probably less likely to tip, my tip amount may reduce because I'm no longer, it's this, and it's like a robot. The food just magically appeared. Um, so what I thought about is this change makes a lot of sense to do during COVID, like during those early phases of COVID when we didn't know, you know, and, but I thought now we've reset the norm. If I'm Dasher, DoorDash or 
Uber Eats or one of these things, I would also want to think, how do I make sure I don't now create this new norm that sticks forever? Once we're <laughs> one day, I don't know when that day is, once we're exiting out of COVID, the never ending, like keeps going farther and farther away. But I, I, I was concerned about a permanent shift, this kind of dehumanized um, thing where it reduces people's tips because it seems like the food just magically appeared there. How's that for you, Ryan? Oh, it says screen sharing again, but you're, I don't see a screen. Did we lose Ryan? You have a great uh, picture of block driveway, ticket versus towing and concreteness. That's oh. what it's supposed to be shared. I don't know why my screen sharing is not happy, but. Oh. Well, this will just be a teaser. You guys will just have to go on, uh, on Twitter and try to check it out. I'm trying to tweet more. Um, so this, this is like public, uh, I'm pre-committing, right? By sharing this, by talking about this now and getting more, hopefully a few of you to follow. Now I'm like pre-committed to needing to tweet, tweet out more, right? So this is behavioral scientists do this stuff all, of, all the time on themselves. So before we go to the wrap, um, who, does anybody have a final question or two um, to, to write us out? I have a question. So I am early in my career, um, but very interested in behavioral science. It is not what I am currently doing. Um, I definitely see how I could use it in what I'm currently doing, but I'd like to be more involved in behavioral science. How would you recommend, I guess, pivoting career paths um, to get in an area that uses behavioral science more? Um all the things concurrently. I mean, I think if you haven't uh, participated in our bootcamp, I think that would probably be my first answer of, of training. Um, and I, I guess it's part of this is rewinding back, right? To, to how I started with how I many years ago asked Dan this question, what do you want to do? What's the end result that you want, right? So if you do want to be a, an academic, then of course you need to pursue that path of the, the PhD, the full PhD. And, and all of that jazz. If you don't, then that that is a very different career path. But I think that path it looks a lot more learn by doing. By the way, fun, funny, quick, quick aside that just shocked me. This was many years ago. Kristen and I were at a conference, an academic conference, and I literally was so long ago that I don't remember what the paper was, what the finding was. But an uh, uh, somebody was up at the stage presenting his findings, and it was actually. And I, I feel bad that I don't remember, but it was actually some kind of fascinating finding. It was great. And we said, cool, uh, we have a question. If you could work with any company to implement what you just researched, this finding, like they could benefit from it, what would it be? And he said, I have no idea. I have not thought about that. And our heads exploded. <laughs> Because we are so, we're like, for me, I mean, the reason, yes, it's fascinating. I think humans are fascinating creatures, like right? all of our biases and all the ways we make mistakes. And it's, you know, in many ways, it's wonderful. I'm, I'm happy that we are as funky as we are. We're not robots. That is wonderful. Um, and the reason that I have so much joy in doing this work is for impact, is so that we can go change this thing. We can go, whether it's DoorDash or it's bigger things like retirement savings, like let's help people. Let's use this science for good and create interventions in a real product, in a real, and maybe it's not a product. Maybe maybe you all are in government and you want to change government, you know, the government nudges, <laughs> um, healthcare, all of the things, you know, it's, it doesn't have to be just this narrow product thing. But I think that would be my my kind of uh, big pitch here. Does that help, Joel? Yes, thank you. And uh, Evelyn, we uh, I think this is a good dot connector, right? Um, your can you talk about your master's degree and how that was applied? Because people often ask me, like, should I get a master's degree? And sometimes I say, yep, you should do it in behavioral science. Sometimes I say, eh, get da do data science and just you know hobby horse on behavioral science but have that data science backward, uh, background. So yours was interesting. Can you just talk about your hot take on that as opposed to doctorates? Um, yeah, again, I think that the main message that I would have here is like, what's the end goal? Where do you want to be in the end? And what are the things that you want to be doing? I would say that's kind of the first thing is like getting a, as much sense as you can of that and then kind of backing in into that, that route. 
Um, and then the other thing would be start small and go bigger. So I actually don't think if you're maybe Joel for you, it may not be, we haven't talked in, in depth, but it sounds like it may be jumping to a master's would be kind of a bigger move. You know, the idea of like boot camp. I think in the long run, Ryan's gonna kill me for this, but it's like we're gonna have more advanced versions. Um, so there there may be levels of like this initial boot camp, initial cohort, we may have advanced versions of that, you know, kind of a step function, unless you're really confident and you're ready to go all in and be like, cool, sign me up for the master's or the PhD. Um, there's so much to be learned. There's so much out there and we're doing our best to put it together and package it and create training pro programs. Ryan's done a, an excellent job of next leveling the content that we, we had um, in the beginning. So yeah, I mean, maybe it's a biased approach for a rational labs person to be like, yeah, do our, do our boot camps. But I think we're, we're just proud of I think how much we've put together that to make it, our goal is to make it very accessible, very applied, very much learn by doing rather than theoretical. And I would say that's one of the big differences is if you do go more of the academic route, make your best effort to try and connect that, try and find a, an internship in parallel with a company that will let you apply some of the insights. Like, yeah, my super strong bias is like learn by doing. Yeah, and I think some master's degrees programs are actually really good at that, and some are terrible at that, right across the board. Yeah, so yeah, I don't want just, that, exactly. Yeah. I don't want to. I'm, I'm not. I should. I probably generalized a little too heavily there. I'm no, I mean, I just, I just think it's worth noting. So you got to if you if you want to get additional credentialing, I'm always like, oh, get some subject matter expertise. If it's some, if you love it, get the expertise. You know what I mean? But um, but make sure the program suits your learning style and and does give you some portfolio pieces at the end as opposed to just abstractions. It's a great point, Evelyn. So um, to wrap up today then, uh, first of all, Sharon asked, Sharon always asks some money questions. So Sharon's like, hey, like what are your favorite BSI resources? And if you didn't see it in the chat, I was like, oh, Sharon, we've got links for that. We've got links and links and links and I've got boilerplate email and oh my gosh. So there's a cool spreadsheet there that the team put together. That's just kind of a list of our BSI resources. Um, that's in the chat. Um, remember, for the time being, our um, all these membership events live in a YouTube playlist. It's this not super secret URL that I just pasted there, and that's always in the calendar invites. So you'll see that if you need to catch something you missed. Um, don't miss out. We want you to have total FOMO on, I don't, I don't know how they're doing the back end. So I'm, I'm going to pretend that you can't even watch it on video. I'm going to pretend that you have to be there in real time. I don't think this is true. But um, but do sign up to see Seth and Evelyn next week. It's going to be a blast. Um, and I feel like I had one more link, but maybe I don't. Oh, no, that's it. Those are all my links. So I think we're in great shape. Um, please come to the open event next week and uh, stay plugged in. Always reach out to me on Slack if you have any questions. And if you had something really burning you needed to ask Evelyn, you should probably tweet it at her because she loves people tweeting at her, but you could also talk to me too. So um, thank you, Evelyn, for all your energy today. Thank you, everybody, for hanging out on Friday, as always. Um, we look forward to seeing you for the next thing. Thanks, all. Wonderful to interact with you all. Good luck on your journeys. Keep us in the loop. <laughs> Take care, everybody.